Well, hey, everybody. Good to see you today. Thank you, John, for those kind words. Um, yeah, so I'm usually sitting right there in like the fifth row. And instead of seeing the back of your heads today, I get to see your eyes. This is a great view up here. I can see why you do it so many weeks in a row. This is a great view. And you know, as I've been preparing to be up here with you guys today, uh, it was about two weeks ago, something happened, an incident happened at my house, and I had wished I had been more prepared. Let me tell you what happened. So it's about five minutes to four o'clock, which gave me about five minutes until our two oldest daughters were gonna come running through the front door straight off the school bus. Now, I'm overachiever, so I only had eight minutes left of my workout, which I was determined to somehow finish in these five minutes. But yeah, that didn't happen. So the school bus was running early, and before I knew it, the front door burst open, our two oldest daughter run inside, and at the same time, we have a little nine-week-old little guy, and he wakes up, of course, right at the same time. So girls come home, and for any of you who have school-age kids, I don't think they feed them during the day, because they run in and are ravenous, like caveman, ravenous, they run in. So here am I in the kitchen opening up the fridge. All right, what are we going to do? So out comes, you know, Brussels sprouts, kale, green beans, chicken. I know I'm a really mean mom feeding them this, right? So out comes all this stuff and three burners, two trays in the oven later. And my only concern is that I don't light little baby brother on fire who is now staring at me from the carrier with eyes like this. I mean, you know, he's number four, so he's going to have to get used to this here. So... See, this was my only concern until uh, the girls have a great idea. Oh, mom, we have a great idea. A water balloon fight. Okay, water balloon fight. Yes, because, right, on a day like today, we have to maximize here in Chicago a water balloon fight. So, in between zhuzhing a tray of kale, I walk around our house to the front window and look out the window and notice that two neighbor kids have decided to join them in this water balloon fight. Now, let me remind you, six kids under the age of nine, three burners, two trays in the oven. Okay, so it's at this moment where we have a three-year-old, uh, the door squeals open again, and the three-year-old, before I can say, stay on the rug, you are soaking wet, is flying through the house, wet footprints, screaming, I have to go potty. And I don't know how we do this as moms, but somehow it's like, Wah! you know, like slow motion after them, and only as a mom can do, scoops them up, picks them up, as she's about to slip, and puts her right on the potty. And then, you know, of course you know what comes next, the words from her mouth. Just kidding, mom. I don't have to go potty. <laughs> Out she flies through the door. Now, by the time my husband John comes home, um, he comes home to very soggy kids, but I will tell you, delicious crispy kale. Yes, thank you. And we go around the table, and you know, if we're all together at dinner, this is what we like to do. We like to just kind of ask, you know, what's your high, your low? How do you experience God for the day? So my high, naturally, is going to be that I didn't light baby brother on fire as I was making dinner. And uh, this time, one of our daughters goes around, and she says that her low is that she has no taste for what mom made for dinner. At that point, my other daughter questions whether the chicken is raw. Now, I have my low of the day. Now, I maybe not have burned baby brother up while I was making dinner, but now there's a possibility of salmonella poisoning for the entire family. Anybody relate to this? Yeah, oh good, oh good. Phew, Whew. Sometimes I think, if you could see what happens, Whew. Yeah. Well, have you ever had a day in which you wish you would have been more prepared? I tell you this story for a reason. All throughout the Bible, we see God has a pattern. God has a pattern for his people. He says, prepare and then move. Prepare and then move. 
We see this in our series of Unleashed. He's asking the first church, prepare and then move, go. And our never the same journey, we learned about Abraham and how God said, prepare and go. And today, we are gonna hear a story about a man named Joshua. And once again, we see God say, prepare and go. And don't we know mission, that God has often been asking us to do the same thing in this season. And so our question for us today is, are we prepared to make a move? So let's jump into this story. We are gonna be in Joshua 1. So you can get there on the app or you can open your Bibles to that. And before we get started and read it, I wanna give you a little context. So we've been in Unleashed, which is in the New Testament. That's one half of the Bible. The other half of the Bible is the Old Testament. And so we are gonna be in the Old Testament today, a story about Joshua. Now, a little context about Joshua. Joshua, at this point of our story, is the leader of the nation of Israel. And this has been a group of people who are on the move. This group of people have actually been wandering around the desert for 40 years. And now we find this nation on the brink of the Jordan River, about to get to the promised land, the land that God has promised them since the time of Abraham. So in Joshua 3, we are engaging right at the climax of this story. So let's read Joshua 3.1. Then Joshua, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way you are to go because you have never gone this way before. But keep a distance about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Now, let's talk about the Ark of the Covenant for a minute. The Ark of the Covenant was a gold wooden covered chest that the priests would carry often preceding the movement of the Israelites. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of the Lord, that the presence of the Lord would go first, and then God's people would follow. He, but he says, keep a distance, 2,000 cubits. That's about 1,000 yards. Do not go near it because you do not know which way you are going. You have not passed this way before. So what's happening here? Joshua is making sure that all the people are on the same page, all of them. Scholars believe this could have been close to 2.5 million people. Could you imagine? 2.5 million people attempting this movement, attempting to cross the Jordan River. And this is what Joshua says. No one moves, no one advances. All of us have to be on the same page here when it comes to this plan. But then Joshua says one more thing. Joshua says we have to be prepared to move. And how does this happen? Let's pick back up the story, Joshua 3, 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. They were given a command to prepare and a promise that God would fulfill. Consecrate yourselves, that's the command, for tomorrow the Lord will do an amazing thing, that's the promise. First this, then that. First prepare, then move. Again, we see this in the story. And how were the Israelites supposed to prepare? Consecration. Now, this is the point in the service where you can squirm in your seats or get super excited that now you have an icebreaker topic for the Memorial Day barbecue. Consecration. Yeah, it's all right. We got this today. We got this. Let's learn about this together. The Hebrew word for consecration is katash. Let's say that together. Katash. It means to separate from the sin and entanglements of life and to separate to the Lord's mission. Separate from and separate to. You know what it means? It means to prepare. Consecration means to prepare, to dedicate, to be holy, to be set apart so that we can move 
It's how we are prepared to move. And one of the ways the Israelites would consecrate themselves would be to physically change their clothes. So part of this preparation that Joshua is asking them to do is to physically change their clothes as a way to symbolize to God, hey, we're setting ourselves apart. We're preparing. We're prepared to see your presence go before us so that we can move. And, you know, I don't know if you ever do this when you're reading the Bible, but you kind of just stop and scratch your head a little bit and you just say, like, but why? Like, why, why consecration? Why did they have to be prepared? I mean, it's God. So if he promises something, like, won't it happen? Won't it just happen? And I found this really helpful quote as I was wrestling through this, and I want to share it with you, that explains more about this. The writer writes, Did you know that generally miracles require a partnership between God and man? Though ultimately God performs the miracle, he expects us to do our part to merit his intervention. You see, I don't totally understand this, but, you know, John, you alluded to this earlier too. Somehow God invites us into this partnership. He doesn't need us, but he wants to do the amazing things amongst us. He could do them without us. And yet, he invites us. He asks us, hey, I want to do it amongst us, amongst you. So again, here's our question. Are we prepared to make a move? Today, I want to focus on two ways in which consecration prepares us. Two ways. First way consecration prepares us is that it frees us. You see, consecration sounds like this scary, intimidating, oh, I got to shift in my seat type of word. Consecration frees us. It's a posture before God to really say, you know what? I'm not fooling anybody. I do not have this life all together. The attitudes, the behaviors, the patterns, my own strength. I cannot do this on my own. And this is where consecration is so freeing because I don't know about you, but I feel that weight sometimes of thinking, ah, I got to do this on my own my own strength. Oh, I got to get better. I got to get better. I got to get better. And consecration frees us. God says, I know you need help preparing. I know you don't have this all together. And guess what? I've made a way to help you prepare. Consecration frees us. And as I think about consecration freeing us, I think of... Um, the Tough Mudder races. Have you guys ever done, anybody ever done a Tough Mudder race? Yeah? Yeah. You guys are clean today. That's nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've never done a Tough Mudder race, but I have friends who have done Tough Mudder races, and they explain to me about these races because, you know, I go on social media, and I'm like, you're so happy for being so dirty. Like, and you paid for that. So help me, help me understand why you're smiling as you're filthy here. And so they explained to me about the race and how at different parts in the race, like, you know, you're just muddy and covered. And at different parts, you're actually stuck. You're trapped. You're in the mud. And then you have a team. You have friends around you who help you get unstuck. Because you can't do it on your own. And help you get unstuck from the mud. And then I just picture my friends, I picture my friends going home and taking a shower. You know, like, not like a, I'm just going to run through the sprinkler. No, like, for real, taking a shower. And then I picture their shower needing to take a shower. Like, they've, you know, their shower then just did a Tough Mudder race after they took a shower. And I picture consecration and how it frees us. It's like a spiritual shower freeing us from our heads to our hearts, cleansed, free, prepared. I think of the classic hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, right? We're talking about all the parts of us, God, that we want to be free, that you would use us to do amazing things among us. Take my life and let it be, consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands, let them move at the impulse of thy love. 
Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my silver and my gold. Take my love, my God, I pour. At thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Take my life and let it be consecrated, freed, Lord, to thee. So what is it for you today? As you look at this hymn, take my what and let it be consecrated, freed, cleansed, Lord, to thee. Maybe God has been giving you new eyes to look around your neighborhood, to see people and faces that maybe you haven't seen before, that he eagerly wants to use you to help share about his love. Maybe in this never the same journey, it's your silver and your gold. It's your treasure. It's your money. It's your income. And for the first time, you're like, oh, God. Right? Okay, okay. Consecrated, free me, God, free me. For me, it's been my lips. God, I don't know how to do this. Fill my lips with messages for thee. Maybe it's your heart. Maybe even for the first time. Maybe today even in worship. As you're wrapping your brain around this Jesus and about his love for you. Maybe today it feels like, ah. Oh, God, I give you my heart. I know I can't do this by myself. Would you free me? Would you cleanse me? Would you prepare me? What is it for you? What do you need to give to God to be spiritually cleansed today, to be free? So that God can do amazing things amongst us. The first way we prepare through consecration is that it frees us. The second way we prepare through consecration is that it makes room. It makes room in our schedules and in our plans, in our agendas, in our houses. John quoted Dallas Willard earlier, and I'm going to do it again. This is what Dallas Willard says about hurry and about making room. He says, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. For hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our world today. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry. It goes against everything in our Chicagoan blood. Oh, man. To eliminate hurry, doesn't it? And I picture the Israelites on the brink of the Jordan River saying, what? Are you kidding me? Why must we go back and prepare? Why must we wait? Hey, remember us? We were like wandering for a long time, right? 40 years, like we're here. We are right here. So what is it, God? Why would you have us make room? Why would you have us stop? And I'm guessing if we went around the room today, all of us would have a why must I wait moment in our life. I'll never forget this Sunday that uh, I was at church, again, sitting in the fifth row right about there. And it was a 915 service, and it was during worship. And it was actually during, we were singing the song, Lion and the Lamb, the first song we sang here today. And I had my eyes closed during worship, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I kind of had like a, just a, a vision. Like God just kind of planted this idea, this vision in my head. And you know what it was a vision of? It was a vision of me teaching the Bible. And this moment happened a year and a half ago, right there. And in the last year and a half, I have said, God, why must I wait? Why? And then John sends me a message the day before my baby is born. 
And then I was like, mm, no, this is not good timing, no. No, like, sleep deprivation is for real, like, no. Yeah, that's not, yeah. After all this time, that's, that's not a good time, God, really, it's not a good time. And I have had nine weeks now to wrestle with this. God, why now? And this is what he has communicated to me without a shadow of a doubt, is because we make room and we stop the hurry, but it is the Lord who does the amazing thing among us. And often he picks the time when it doesn't make sense. Because it is in his power and it is in his presence that we go. And sometimes he tells us to make room, put aside our agendas, our plans, our schedule, so that when the presence of the Lord goes before us and he says it's go time, it is clear in whose strength performs the miracle. Amen. Yes. Consecration will not only mess with our schedules, but it will make our schedules. Are we free? Are we free? Do we feel free today? Have we made room in this whole preparation journey? And as you're listening to these two points, you're either saying, yes, no, sort of, I don't know. What should I do? Well, I want to share with you two simple tools, resources, that have been really helpful for me on this consecration journey to help me prepare. And, you know, picture us again. I use this analogy because we're talking about the wilderness here. Maybe two, like, walking sticks. Two walking sticks that help us on this journey. The first tool is an Alpha Bible reading plan. This is actually an app you can download on your phone. You can, uh, if you're in the Mission app now, there's a link to it. It will help you get through the Bible in a whole year. And if you're like me, you have great uh, intent to read the Bible, but it's hard. And the intentionality is hard. And making room is hard. And uh, this has been one of the greatest things that have helped me since January. You can play it. It'll read to you. If you've done Alpha here, you know Nikki Gumbel's fantastic accent. You can hear him every day on your app. He'll give you helpful commentary as you'll make it through scripture in the year. And we are in the middle of May, almost end of May here. But could you imagine if you started today? From today until the end of the year, if you ingested more of the Bible. You could play it while you're taking a shower. You could play it while you're driving. You could play it while you're making breakfast. But a way to ingest the Bible. That's one walking stick here. The Alpha app is really helpful. Second one is how we digest the Bible. So once we ingest it in us, what do we do then? How do we make this apply to our lives today? Helpful thing is called SOAP Devotions. So it stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. And this is the way that we actually figure out what God is speaking to us through Scripture. And, and God, you know, maybe, maybe you're here on Sunday and sometimes you think, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Or you pick up the Bible and you think, that's exactly what I needed. God answers prayers in real time. I didn't know what I was going to uh, be talking about. And my friend Andrea just kept saying, pray for a verse, pray for a verse, pray for a verse. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to pray for a verse. And it was a Thursday. And I was listening to a podcast, and there was a certain passage that was talked about. Came here on Sunday, and I was reminded of a certain passage. On Monday, April 23rd, as I opened up my Alpha Bible reading plan, guess what passage was for that day? Consecrate yourselves, for the Lord will do amazing things among you. We if we ingest and digest the Bible, God will answer these prayers in real time. And maybe you're like me sometimes too, where you think like, well, okay, how am I, where do I start? How do I understand this? Like this is only for people who teach the Bible. And then one day you find yourself up here teaching the Bible. <laughs> so just to normalize this for all of us, I wanna show you this card. Last week we walked out of, we walked out of church and uh, my husband John and I went to 
pick up our six-year-old Julia from Mission Kids. And she comes running after us and she's, Mama, Papa, Mama, Papa, look what I did, look what I did. And she has this card in her hand. And she said, guess what? I did a soap devotion during Mission Kids today. I said, that's great. She said, yeah, for a while it was just Miss Kathy and I and our circle. And I said, I see my papa do these soap devotions, Miss Kathy. Would you help me do a soap devotion? Our six-year-old can do a soap devotion. This book was meant to be understood. It was meant to be ingested and digested so that the power of God communicating to us could help us, could lead us, could convict us, could guide us into where we are to move and where we are to go. Maybe one of your next steps is to do Alpha or Formation this summer. You don't have to do this alone. These steps are all part of uh, our growth plan. We'll show you about the app. We'll show you about the soap devotions. You don't have to do this alone. And you already belong here because you're here. You don't have to earn anything to belong here. So maybe your move, maybe your step in preparation is to be a part of one of those groups this summer. God prepares his people and then he has them go. Consecration frees us and allows us to make room so that the Lord can do amazing thing among us. Now let's pick back up at this story and find out what happens. All the Israelites now have consecrated themselves, and let's see what the Lord is about to do. Joshua 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance and away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zerenim, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. We see it again. God's presence goes first and his people follow. And he did this during the harvest when the Jordan would be overflowing, the most impossible of situations. After 40 long years, God says, now move so that my power it will made, be made known in the most impossible of situations. All, the whole nation, can I remind us, probably 2.5 million Israelites were set to cross this. We see it in Acts, all the believers. We see it here, all the Israelites. What about us? Let's make it all of us mission, that we would be prepared that would be on a journey to being prepared, that we would take a step even today to consecrate ourselves, to prepare so that the Lord could do amazing things even among us. I want to wrap up this message by um, circling back all the way to the first story I told you. Remember the Brussels sprouts and try not to burn my little baby? So it ties in with this picture. Many of us, this, we were at this event, Advanced, Com Advanced Commitment Night, and it was, for the majority of us, our first time in our church building, our new church building. And one of the activities we were invited to do was to write prayers on this part of the floor so that we would be a church that was built on prayer. And many of us wrote prayers of what was on our heart, Many of us wrote people's names of people we feel so burdened for. Ah, oh, that we just want God's love to wash over them. And they would know that they could believe that they could be cleansed and they could be freed. Well, on this section of floor is the name of the family of those two kids who were joined in the water balloon fight. 
We are desperate to see our neighborhood be changed. Desperate. And in a Monday, on the most mundane of Mondays, as I look out my window and see two kids playing in my neighborhood, God says, go. My presence has gone before you. There are people to love, have eyes to see. Be free, make room, and go. And it can be a, it can be a mundane Monday, it can be a manic Monday, Maybe even tomorrow, maybe even tomorrow, you would sense the Lord's presence going before you. Maybe even if we don't feel perfect in our preparation. That's where I get tripped up, right? I didn't feel prepared. But God helps us in this preparation. And as we take steps, he sees us, he knows us, and he wants to do amazing things among us. And as you can imagine, consecration doesn't mean easy. It doesn't mean all our fears are removed and all the problems of life are gone. And I don't think it was by accident, although God doesn't do anything by accident, that two chapters before in Joshua, we see God give him another command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be terrified. And the word here doesn't lend itself to meaning physical strength. Although, could you imagine, he's like, hey, I got like 2.5 million people to help here. Like, physical strength would really be great at this time. You know what it means? It means fears under <coughs> control. Fears under control. To be brave on this journey. I'm going to pray for us, and then we will respond in a time of worship. And I would invite you in this time of worship to consecrate yourself before God, the same God who parted the Jordan River. And during this song, whatever you need to do, to be free, to be cleansed, to make room. Maybe you want to close your eyes. Maybe you want to put your hands up. Maybe you want to put your hands out. Maybe you want to kneel. Maybe you want to face plant. Whatever you need today to do that, I invite you. God's right there. He's with us. He doesn't leave this preparation journey to us. He helps us. Let's pray. Oh God, you are so for us. You are not against us, God. Your love washes over us. You call us out beyond the shore into the wave. You call us to be brave, to be strong, to be courageous. And God, you ask us, you invite us into this partnership with you. Make us brave, God, as we consecrate ourselves to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.